actually we should really revert and say this presentation of with Adam Minter presenting his book Junkyard Planet. If you guys are having technical difficulties tonight, please just put a message in the chat and my colleague Cassie or I will help you with those. Um, I suggest, and I know most of you are pros at this point on uh, the Zoom thing, but just putting it in, in a speaker view so you get the highlighted presentation and the speaker enlarged. Um, there's gonna be time for Q&A at the end, so feel free to throw your questions in throughout and um, both myself and my partner, Beth G Gabriel at the Milwaukee Public Library, will be monitoring that and we'll be relating the questions to Adam as uh, after his presentation. And I've got to thank, first of all, our partners at the Milwaukee Public Library. They're so tremendous and they've shared this with the community and they do so many great things about encouraging uh, broad, not just literacy, but like really directed understanding subjects and topics. And so we're so happy to partner with them. I also have to thank our fabulous funders from the Wisconsin, from Wisconsin Humanities. Uh, we received a major grant from them and that includes funding from the NEA um, and from the state of Wisconsin. So thank you so much for that support. When we were developing the pieces of this exhibit and figuring out how we could relate this exhibit one of the big questions people kept asking is, well, where does recycling really go? What are we doing when we recycle something? What happens to our recycling? And these are all really difficult questions. And it's a little bit fraught in this moment that you start thinking, well, I've heard some things about China. I've heard other things. I don't know. I hear that I should recycle these things. I hear I can't recycle anything. I feel like, and it's, there's so much conflicting information Adam's book, Junkyard Planet, did such an amazing job of bringing this story home to me and making me, first of all, understand the global impact of my decisions, but also just understanding how broad scrap is and how wide ranging uh, the, the range of products that can be scrapped and are scrapped are. So I'm really excited to hear. I feel like this is almost like getting an addendum to the book. If you'd like to buy the book, we have it available for sale. Cassie's going to throw a link up. You can pick it up at JMM or we'll, we're happy to ship it to you. Um, and now it's my pleasure to turn it over to my uh, colleague at Milwaukee's East Library, Beth Gabriel, who um, is going to introduce Adam. Hi, thank you so much for having me here this evening, um, Ellie in the Jewish Museum and Adam. I'm so thrilled to be included in tonight's author feature and presentation. The Milwaukee Li Public Library is committed to an environmental literacies and working with our community partners, of which the Jewish Museum is such an important one, um, especially as we as a library are diving into our citywide race equity and inclusion initiative in the coming year. Um, with that in mind, um, I will ask um, Ellie and her team to put a link in the chat. Um, the library wants to hear from all of you, so please consider filling out a brief survey to help us at MPL provide the best services to our patrons, creating a culture of inclusion and equity where all are welcome. So just check the chat in a couple minutes for that link. Um, I also want to invite everyone to check out a really amazing book list that my team at the library put it together for this um, wonderful exhibit, the Scrap Yard Innovators of Recycling exhibit. Um, it'll give you further reading along with Adam's book, which was just amazing when I read it. Um, the list and more are available to you at your Milwaukee Public Library with your card. You can also pick up a really cool upcycle take and make Hanukkah craft kit at all of our library locations and the museum while supplies last. I just put one together with my children and it was really a lot of fun and it includes this amazing informational booklet that will walk you through how to make everything, highlight all the STEM principles that are involved, talk about recycling and scrapping and the things that you can do with items in your home and um, also other um, cultures that use candle lighting as part of their tradition. Um, and then that's all for me about the library, but without further ado, let me introduce our featured speaker tonight, Adam Minter. Adam is a columnist with Bloomberg Opinion and the best-selling author of Junkyard Planet, Travels in the Billion Dollar Trash Trade. And 
Also, secondhand travels in the new global garage sale. He spent nearly two decades based in Shanghai and Kuala Lumpur, reporting and writing on the inner workings of the global recycling trade. In addition to recycling, Minter also writes widely on China, technology, and culture. So everyone, let's please welcome Adam, who's going to take over our presentation this evening. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Ellie, and thank you, Cassie, and thank you, the Jewish Museum. This is, um, for reasons you'll see as I get more into the presentation, this is very meaningful to me to speak uh, at a Jewish museum, at a Jewish venue about Jewish scrap dealers and, and the Jewish scrap industry. I first saw this exhibit that this talk is timed to um, when it was in Baltimore. And, uh, and I think it's just terrific. Um, I know many of the people who helped to organize uh, so many of the various pieces and artifacts that are in it. I consider some of the people in the exhibit personal friends and, and even closer, which I'll get into uh, in a little bit. So um, I am going to, you're gonna see my face now and you're gonna see my face at the end, but mostly you're going to see uh, my presentation. And we're going to go through a bunch of slides tonight. And I'm going to take you um, literally around the world. Um, so I'm going to right now shift from me uh, to the PowerPoint. I'm sharing my screen. And here we go. So I want to start with this photo. This photo was taken in the early 20th century uh, in Russia, probably in Minsk, we're not sure. I've spoken to the family members who had it. And um, we have three gentlemen here. Only the one on the left is known. His name is Abe Leader. He, was, he looks like a young dandy, um, but it wasn't a very dandyish life. Um, at that point, he was getting ready to leave Russia for the United States because he was going to be inducted into the Tsar's army and he was Jewish and that was not a good place for a young Jewish man to end up. So it wasn't all bad. Um, he had dreams of being a vaudevillian, believe it or not. He wanted to go into show business from being a, uh, you know, a poor fellow in uh, Minsk to being a vaudevillian. Um, but it wasn't easy either because he was going to leave his family behind and that haunted him the rest of his life. Still, uh, he got on the boat and his first great misfortune was um, he was taken to Galveston, Texas and not New York. So not a great place to be a vaudevillian. And when he landed in Galveston, he had no English no education, no workable skills. So what do you do when you don't have any skills and you land somewhere? Well, he did what a lot of people do around the world. He became a rag picker, literally picking rags off the streets and selling them for recycling. It's not, a, back then it wasn't new and it's not new now, people still do it. Um, uh, here we have a picture from a company called Star Wipers in Ohio. And what they do is they buy bed sheets and clothes from all over the world and cut them up into rags and sell them to auto shops, bars, hotels, anybody who needs to wipe something down. So Abe got to start selling to businesses like these. Um, he quickly moved up in the world. Um, rather than picking textiles off the streets, he started picking metal off the streets of Galveston. And he did something like this. There's no pictures of Abe doing this. This is a picture I took in uh, Shanghai uh, almost 20 years ago in 2002. Um, it is and was an emerging market, just like Galveston in the early 20th century. There was a lot of construction going on then. And so people who don't have other means of employment they go and they do this, they find metal, they take it around and they sell it to mills that make it into stuff so that uh, you can send it somewhere else and, uh, and make new things from it. Now, it wasn't all good days. Abe had days like this. Uh, this is a photo I took in Beijing. Uh, the man on the right is Mr. Li, that's his wife. And they live in this trailer. This is actually an old shipping container and they go around picking up, they did it this time, uh, recycling from around the neighborhood where they are and they sort through it. So it's a tough life, but again, what do you do? In Beijing, they're immigrants. They come from a place called Sichuan province that speaks an entirely different dialect of Chinese. They're heavily discriminated against. So you pick trash, just like Abe did. I wanna introduce you to another character. The man in the striped shirt is a man by the name of Raymond Lee. Um, this is a photo taken in Guangdong province. You've all heard of Guangdong. And if you haven't heard of Guangdong, you have things from Guangdong. It's when you talk about the factory of the world to the world, it's actually this province in Southern China. They make everything and everybody has something from there. So including maybe the computers we're all uh, talking to each other on and listening to each other on. Uh, to Raymond's right is his wife, Yao Ye. And to his left is cousin Yao. 
Um, and um, all of them are very important characters in Raymond's life. Now, Raymond grew up poor, kind of like uh, Abe Leader, but he didn't uh, have to immigrate. He stayed in Guangdong province in a very rural part of it. He didn't have very many good prospects after graduating high school. So he went and he worked in a paint and chemical factory and he could have stayed there for the rest of his life. Um, but his wife had better ambitions for him. His wife uh, wife's family was in the scrap business. And in those days, that meant you go to the port and you buy the scrap that's been exported from the United States and Europe and Japan, and you take it home and you clean it up and you send it to someone that melts it down to make it into new stuff. So Raymond thought this is a better opportunity for me than working in the paint factory. And that's what he did. And so this is not Raymond's family, but this is, uh, this is, uh, these are a bunch of electric motors. Um, and electric motors power everything, everything from amusement park rides to the washing machine and dryer in your house or down at the laundromat. Um, but they eventually wear out and they need to be recycled, but they're hard to recycle because they're made primarily of two different types of metal, copper, which you can see she's trying to chisel off there, and then different kinds of steel. So Raymond used to go down to the port and he'd buy a bunch of these, take them home, and the family would break them apart. And it's interesting because that's something that my uh, that Abe Leader would do back in the day uh, when he was scrapping in Galveston and eventually up in Minneapolis. He also did stuff like this. This is wire stripping. So all that wire that gets pulled out of houses or pulled out of the ground when you see a utility change, um, it's got to be recycled. But it's not easy to be recycled off the bat because you need to uh, you need to separate the insulation from uh, the wire. So here's a you know a, a low tech way of doing it. These are wire strippers. These were all over China 20, 15 years ago, and and that's something that Raymond bought and brought home. And the family would get a big pile of wire and they'd strip the wire and then they'd sell it. And, uh, and it would be a really, uh, you know, a good day's living. Okay, okay, sorry. Raymond uh, grew as a business. He was very successful, he's a good businessman. And eventually, instead of going down to the port and buying what other people uh, imported, he made enough money where he could actually order containers from the United States, and primarily, which is where he ordered them from, and, and, and import them right to his scrapyard that he built uh, in a town called Shijiao. Um, this may look to, like junk to people who don't know the business, but that's a shipping container, and that's very high value copper. And depending on the market, uh, that container and that copper could be worth tens of thousands of dollars. And by the early 20 teens, Raymond had the ability to not just import one of these, he could import dozens of these at a time. He had grown up that much. Why? Well, China was an emerging market and people needed raw materials. Recycling is all about raw materials. And Raymond very quickly figured out that he could make a living by supplying raw materials to all those factories in China that were making the stuff being sent back to the US or making stuff for Chinese consumers. So let's go back to Abe Leader. Um, you know, one way of looking at what Abe did is he was also supplying raw materials to an emerging market because that's what the US was in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, up to World War II. Um, he did it a little differently. There was a lot more stuff in the US in those days. So he would go scrapping in people's backyards. He also would go scrapping uh, at farms, lots of farm scrap, farmers, broken down equipment, that kind of thing. That was a really good thing for uh, Abe Leader. And over time, he also grew and he also got himself a scrapyard. And uh, this, is, uh, this was provided to me by the family. This is from 1947, a couple of years after World War II. And this is what he would be buying from factories. So factories generate a lot of recycling. You know, when they, they have stuff drip on the floor, they cut stuff and all that's little pieces and bits and pieces. And so as Abe grew, especially during World War II, because World War II was very good for uh, Abe and it created a lot of manufacturers who created scrap and wanted scrap. That's what Abe did. And you can see this is, a, you know, in 1947, $843 worth of scrap metal. That was not a small thing. I don't know what that is in today's dollars, but it's many, many, many thousands of dollars. The, the fella did, did good coming in from Russia. And here is his scrapyard. Back in the day, I, we think this photo was taken in the late 1950s, but by that point, he could afford a crane, he could afford a truck. Um, he too had grown uh, into, you know, somebody comfortable uh, because of the scrap business. And here is a wonderful picture of Abe with his family. Abe uh, looks different by this point. This would have been in the late 1950s, we think. Um, he's the gentleman in the back with kind of the odd um, homemade haircut 
sort of grimacing a little bit. Um, and that's his family. Now, I want to point out to all the way over to the left of the photo, uh, to Abe's right, um, there's a smiling young man with a two colored tie. That's Mort Leader. Um, if you go through the exhibit at the museum, you'll actually see Mort quoted in it at one point. Um, you have to look for it, but he's quoted. He was Abe's oldest son. And just to give you a sense of how the Jewishness was maintained, um, the family tells the story, the four siblings to Abe, when it was time for Abe's bar mitzvah um, to pay for it, Abe had kept a bunch of copper scrap down in the basement and it needed to be separated from a bunch of brass scrap. So to pay for the uh, bar mitzvah uh, for weeks uh, in the evenings, the family would sit down there and clean and separate brass from copper. And that's how they paid for the bar mitzvah. Um, another person to keep uh, an eye on is to go all the way down, the young man in the dark shirt, a little pudgy, um, that's Mickey. And that was Abe's grandson. And Mickey um, grew up riding on Abe's truck going to buy scrap. And if we jump ahead here, you'll see him all the way to the right. That's Mickey in his scrapyard. And that's me uh, in need of a haircut. So I am, uh, to put it uh, just directly, I am a descendant of this industry. Uh, so it's very personal for me to be talking to you tonight uh, as somebody who grew up in it. Um, you know, it's, it's meaningful to me and it's meaningful to my, to my family. My father continued in the business. He, he broke off from Leader Brothers, which is a story in its own right. We won't go into tonight, but, but it's still there. It's still in the family. Um, so I did not go into the business. Um, I grew up in it. I worked in it for many years in my 20s, but for a variety of reasons, one of which is that I'm very good at, I'm very, I'm, I'm very bad at doing business. I'm pretty good at writing about business. So we all realized the business would probably be better off if I stayed as far away from it as possible. Um, family businesses are tough. Family scrap businesses are tough. Uh, you know, any family business has tensions and we've all read the novels and seen the sitcoms and everything else. I didn't want any of that. And I, I had a little spilkus. I wanted to go out and see the world. I didn't want to just spend my time uh, in the scrap business. So I moved on and I became a journalist. And my primary client was a magazine called Scrap Magazine, which is a trade magazine uh, for the industry called the, uh, and the industry um, uh, association called the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries, ISRI, which contributed to the exhibit, Scrapyard. Um, this was just one of the features I did for them. I moved to uh, Shanghai in 2002 and literally traveled all over the world, around the world several times, um, looking at how recycling was done in various places. Um, and this was one of my favorite pieces. This was, uh, we've decided, in, I think it was 2005, 2006, to find out how things were being recycled in India after spending four years uh, looking into China. It was really fun. Uh, the discovery of a kid who grew up in the scrap business, loving the scrap business, going out and seeing things still that surprised me. It was, it was the same everywhere and it was different. I want to give you an example. Okay, here we go. One scrap here that I visited. This was uh, in 2008, I believe. Um, I saw this big pile of stuff and I thought, oh, a bunch of extension cords. But it turned out it was not extension cords. It was Christmas tree lights. So just you can see that a big pile of Christmas tree lights. And when I saw it, the guy who took me to see this, I, I immediately I was starting to think about writing a book about scrap and recycling at that time. And the light bulb went off or broke as it being as it was uh, Christmas lights. So I, I thought this is how I'm going to start a book about scrap recycling. I'm going to write about how Christmas tree lights are recycled. Easier said than done. Um, I had to find somebody who would take me to see those plants. So this is my friend, Johnson Zeng. Uh, uh, throughout the 2000s and into the late 20 teens, he would drive around the United States going from scrapyard to scrapyard to scrapyard, buying lots of wire, especially Christmas tree light wire. So he took me around with him. I drove around with him, watching him find and buy Christmas tree light wire, communication cable, whatever kind of wire it was. Um, Let's see, sometimes, okay, so, you know, wire, I know this one was in Indiana, um, Ohio, finally a bunch of Christmas tree light wire in North Carolina. And so after showing me where all the Christmas tree wire was, Christmas tree lights were, I said to Johnson, great, I got it. But uh, the reason I'm driving around with you is I want to see what happens to it. And he said, okay, well, when you get back to China, I was living in Shanghai at this time, you call my friend uh, Raymond down in uh, Shijiao, and he will, uh, he will take you to see. So, There we go. Uh, this is a, this is Raymond's family. Raymond, the brilliant part, job on my part. Raymond is the one guy not in the photo. You can see his legs and the tan khakis all the way to the left. But the point is, uh, it's a family business. 
Yeah, and for, you know, he was going to take me to dinner with everybody involved in the business, including some friends. It reminded me a lot, and reporting on scrap businesses in China reminded me a lot of my family and the Jewish scrap families that I knew growing up. And so we had this wonderful meal, ate some food. They decided, okay, he's okay. Um, he can come and see our Christmas tree light recycling line. Now, one, uh, if you recall, I'm going to show you this in a moment. Early on, uh, Raymond uh, had his cousin, cousin, cousin Yao, who is his wife's uh, son, uh, uh, brother, younger brother in there. Cousin Yao um, was, you know, was a brilliant student. He had the opportunity to go to a great engineering school, and he did. And Raymond, at that point, had enough money to pay for it. And then when he graduated, he could have gone to, have, to anywhere to be employed, but he wanted to go right back into the scrap business. Um, and, and, you know, Raymond said, are you sure? And he said, yeah. And so uh, he came into the scrap business. And one of the things he wanted to do was design a way to recycle Christmas tree lights because they got a lot of them. Now, the way Christmas tree lights were recycled before what I'm going to show you is, is real simple. You take Christmas tree lights, put them in a big pile, dump a bunch of gasoline on it, set it on fire. And in the morning, you got a pile of crusty copper. Bad for the environment. You don't get to recycle the, uh, the uh, rubber and, you know, and air pollution and everything else. And the government didn't like it. So uh, Cousin Yao does not devise this system. It took about six months. And uh, it's brilliant. Um, now, the town where they put this, Shijiao, this was one of 10 factories that had a system somewhat along these lines. And, uh, and the town of Shijiao at its peak was importing around 20 million pounds of American Christmas tree lights per year. So I'm going to play this and uh, talk you through it. And hopefully it goes cleanly. And if it doesn't, oop, uh, wait, um, here we go. OK, so how do you do this? Well, you start out by tossing the uh, Christmas tree lights into that machine. It's a shredder. It chops them up. That's not smoke. That's steam because you got to pour water in there because there's blades going around really, 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 really fast, chopping those up and it gets hot. What comes out? It's this goop, which is um, plastic, metal, glass. And what do you do with that? Well, you shovel it onto these tables that are tilted upwards and there's water shooting them across them. And the light stuff, the plastic and the glass go off one end. And then the heavier stuff, the copper, goes off the other. And so you see how that copper is coming off there because it's heavier and the other lighter stuff is flowing off the other side. You separate it right out. And you can see she's pulling out this really nice clean copper. Um, it was really hard to calibrate this, which is, you know, I'm sure you can believe, um, but they did it. And it's all, um, you know, Cousin Yao's kind of genius. And here's, you get a look at it, what they're pulling out of there. So it's pretty cool. And sometimes they run it through another time. You see the mix up of brass and everything. Um, you can see one more, here's a pick of it, where you see the, the tables tilted upwards and you can see the plastics down on the bottom. Um, that's in a little bit of uh, copper down there, but mostly it's the plastics. Uh, people often ask me what happens to the water. It just circulates through the system. So it doesn't get dumped in the river that runs next to this. So it, it's super cool. And it shows, you know, they're upwardly mobile. They're, you know, investing in the education of their kids and they're making the world a better place. And, and they're in the process getting even more wealthy. That's a big pile of copper. Um, that's worth, I, I don't know, maybe if we had some scrap people on the call here today, they can tell you. But, you know, at the time this was taken, copper was, you know, in the range of over $3 per pound. And that's a lot of poundage there. So it's so they did, they did really, really well with this. So let's go back to Minneapolis from Shijiao, Shijiao to Minneapolis. So this is a picture of the scrapyard I grew up in. Um, it's, uh, it was just outside of downtown Minneapolis, scrap metal processors is what it's called. Little warehouse, um, certainly not as extravagant or as uh, wealthy as what Raymond pulled off in China, much to his credit. But it was home. I look at this and I kind of get homesick for those days a little bit. Um, some of my earliest memories are running around this warehouse and other warehouses. And I don't recommend letting your toddler run around scrap warehouses. Um, bad idea. Um, but, you know, if you own a scrap warehouse, it's going to happen. And they're really magical places. Just keep an eye on the kid. Trust me. And this is my Bobby. Um, and she worked uh, in the scrapyard and um, she would love to be on this call. She passed away about 10 years ago, um, but she was really um, central uh, to my uh, understanding of junk. She taught me a lot of what I know more than maybe even my father. They might argue over that. 
Um, but she worked at the, at the office and what she would do is when trucks came or people came with their recycling, she would um, you know, get the weights from the truck scale and uh, record them and uh, you know, be tough on the customers and uh, argue with the truck drivers and then be really nice to me. Um, now, I want you to see her office, very important. There's two things to note in the office. Uh, number one, in the foreground, that's her paper shredder. Uh, if you need anything to disappear, you go to the bubby. It's how it is. And there's no two ways about it. And then in the back, even more important, is the refrigerator, where there was always at least three or four dozen frozen kosher hot dogs. And so if you're on your good side, you got a kosher hot dog. And if you were a really good customer, she might even go through the trouble of defrosting a bun for you, um, which you know was not done for everybody. But it was a very, it was a family business. Um, and that's one of the things that made it work. We trusted each other and um, you know, it was a lot of fun. Now, she was also a true scrap character. Here she is with some of the fellas in the warehouse. And she loved hanging out with these guys. And these guys are bigger than they look. The fella on the left, the one with the American flag t-shirt, keep an eye on his face. He once fought George Foreman. So, um, you know, it, you know, you can see the, the resemblance there. Yeah. Uh, Rocky Sikorsky. It didn't work out well, but he did it. Um, but the interesting about Rocky is, you know, he boxed. And then when he was done boxing, he needed to go into something. And so he did what a lot of people sort of outsiders, because boxers are outsiders. He, he went into uh, the scrap business. The funny thing about Rocky is he was terrified of my bummy because on payday, she would chase after him to make sure that he would uh, take some of his money and put it in his retirement account. So he would literally, this giant man would hide from her this tiny woman in the warehouse. So she wouldn't run off with his money, you know, into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, into the um, uh, retirement account. So this is how I think of her. And I would, this was a photo I took when I was living in China, in Shanghai. And uh, I was home and I took a picture and I, want, and I put it on my wall. Um, she didn't really like me photographing her at the desk, but it reminded me of when I would call her up, which was most days, I'd call her up, it'd be the morning and she'd be on the phone and truck drivers would be yelling at her, Betty, Betty, I need the weight. You're talking to Adam, but we got to give me the weight. Um, but she always wanted to know where I was. And she was worried. You know, it, she would always say, where are you? What are you doing? And I would tell her I'm in this or that place. And, and, and she always sounded nervous until I told her I was at a scrapyard. And then she'd be like, oh, okay. You know, so I would talk to her from, say, a place like this. This is a, a company in Shanghai I went to several times to write about. Sigma. Um, you know, I was at Sigma. And there's hundreds of people sorting metal there. That's what this factory is that would import um, in the United States and most developed countries and even developing countries. The way we recycle automobiles is we shred them into tiny pieces. You can see them here. And, uh, and then people, and then at the time, a lot of it was sent to China for hand sorting into the constituent metals. Um, and these are the best metal sorters in the world. Now more and more of it's done using technology. But if I told her I was at a metal sorting warehouse, she'd be like, okay. You know, I thought she, she seemed to feel good about that metal sorting warehouse. I know how to do metal sorting. Okay, familiar. Um, but I started realizing um, after she passed, and this is a photo taken after she passed in Benin in West Africa, that there was actually more to it, the, that comfort level with her. Um, this is a, sort, a clothing sorting warehouse. These are clothes that have been imported um, primarily from Europe and Canada. And these men in Benin are Nigerian immigrants in Benin. They go to Benin um, to make a living for themselves, a better living for themselves. And they become very expert um, in sorting clothes uh, for the Nigerian market. They know what colors go well in this Nigerian town or that Nigerian town. Uh, they know by feel, you know, the quality of the clothing. It's, it's highly skilled, highly knowledgeable work. I have tremendous respect for them. And the man in the orange shirt here is, uh, is, um, is a real character. <laughs> uh, his name is Michael Ogbana. And Michael is the person, um, long story, but I found him to take me around uh, Benin's clothing import uh, operations. And Benin sorts clothing um, for uh, towns in Nigeria. I mean, just millions and millions of pounds of it. And he took me here and he said something that uh, really almost, um, it, it made me sort of stop in my tracks. As we're going through here, and I wrote it in my notebook and I pulled it up uh, from my notes from that day, um, he said, to me, who would lie about doing this kind of work? And the reason it made me freeze is because one of the ways I always 
sort of opened doors for myself and, and, you know, and thawed the ice that sometimes was around my reporting in emerging market countries is I would go in and I would tell people like Michael Obama, you know, this is not news, new to me. Um, I grew up in this industry, you know, I sorted metal copper from brass when I was a kid, you know, and, and it usually thawed things, you know, and, and, and just, I, we were on the level at that point. And when he said that to me, when he said, who would lie about doing this kind of work, it suddenly hit me. He didn't believe me when I told him that. And maybe others didn't believe me either. Um, why would this white journalist, you know, who flew in from Kuala Lumpur, um, if he, you know, he, he couldn't, he couldn't be from this industry because he wouldn't be able to be flying in. Um, and it was only when he's walking through there with me through this warehouse, this very unpleasant warehouse. It's, it's great work, but it's hot. Benin is extremely hot. These warehouses filled with clothes. You can imagine you're in a very, you know, it's 95 degrees in a, in a warehouse filled with clothes, with clothing fibers in the air. It's hot. Who would lie about this kind of thing? And I started reflecting back on some of my phone calls um, uh, uh, with my grandmother. And I started reflecting back on some of the visits I had uh, with other people in the scrap industry. For example, this is a photo of a man by the name of Mr. Nakatsuji. This is taken in Tokyo several years ago. Mr. Nakatsuji at the time was the uh, head of the Japan Iron and Steel Recycling Industry Association, which is a trade association of recyclers, not just iron and steel, but that's what they called it. And he's also the CEO of a company called Nakatsuji, which is a century old scrap company. Um, whoop. Uh, this, this is the photo he gave to me. This is the best we have, but you get the idea. It was you know, sort of a small, uh, scrap company, nothing too spectacular when it started out, but it certainly became spectacular. And you can see now it's a very modern company with very modern equipment and the Japanese government likes to feature it to people. And so I thought he would be very proud to feature it to me as a journalist. And he was, I'm going to come back to him now. And in the course of our conversation and interview, uh, I got to asking him a question that I ask most people in the scrap industry. How did you get into this business? Now, usually, if it's an American, they're thrilled to tell you, my family came from Minsk or my family came from here or there. His face kind of went dark. And he said, and I thought I insulted him in some way. And he says, well, we don't really talk about that. And I, and I didn't know what to say. And then he said, well, oh, here's the deal. He said, you know, uh, our background is Korean. Now, if you know anything about Japan and Korea, um, you know, Jap uh, Koreans were brought to Japan as slave laborers a century ago, treated very badly. There are long standing, very vicious levels of discrimination against them in Japan. And it's not something he wanted to talk about. But it occurred to me that, like the Nigerians in Benin, um, like the Jews in Minneapolis, like um, some of the other folks I'm going to show you, the, the Sichuanese in Beijing, he too was an outsider to the industry, they were immigrants and it's what they could do. It's what was available to them. So just as I said, here we are in Beijing, um, Mr. Lee and his wife. You know, if you, if you know Chinese and you hear somebody speaking, who's from Sichuan speaking, it's, 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 uh, it's a different language entirely. The only thing I compare it to in, in English terms is maybe a really heavy Southern accent, at least in the United States. You just know they're from outside. And there's severe discrimination against um, people from the outer provinces, even to this day in Beijing um, and in other big Chinese cities. They're, they're looked down upon. They're seen as the people who pick up the garbage because that's the only thing they can do. So they're outsiders. Why do they go into scrap? Because it was available to them. Ghana. Um, a place I really love and I've traveled to many times. And in the, the more recent book, Secondhand, I talk about Ghana quite a bit. Um, this is a very famous place. Some of you might have even heard of it called Agbag Bloshi, uh, which is a big dump in the heart of Accra, the capital of Ghana. It's been called incorrectly the world's largest e-waste dump. In fact, uh, people get it wrong. It's actually a giant automobile recycling operation. Um, and it reminds me of some of the ones I grew up seeing. But the people who work here, including the woman you see walking through there, are not the people from wealthy Accra, the capital. They're people from the north of Ghana, which is much poorer. And they move down to work in Accra. And when they can't find other employment, they come and work here. They're outsiders in the industry. It's what they do when they can't find something else. Um, this is Yusuf Mahama. He's the tribal elder um, from the Dagbani tribe, 
That's the tribe that's primarily represented in Agbag Boshi, this giant dump and automobile recycling yard. Um, and I spent some time with him a few years ago. Uh, very interesting man, very gentle man, but uh, you can see there's, there's a backbone of, of titanium as well. And I was talking to him about being Dagbani in Accra and he says, it's very hard for our people to find employment. And he said, so we created this space for our people to have somewhere to work. That's what he said to me. I actually pulled it out of my notes. And I was very moved by that because it kind of got me thinking again about my Bubby and Abe leader. And that brings me back to this. And I began to, oops, it doesn't, there we go. And it began to, uh, you know, I began to realize what my grandmother was really saying to me, you know, when she was, when she was okay with me being around so-called scrap people, you know. It was a commonality and it was a familiarity, but it really wasn't about the fact that she and I know how to sort copper from brass. And so do the people in Agbagboshi and in Shanghai and in Changsha or wherever I was calling her from. Um, it was a shared, it's being a shared identity as being outsiders, you know, and that's um, as trash pickers, as junk people, junk men, junk women, um, Jews and a marginalized profession. All of a sudden, you know, as I'm traveling the world and I'm explaining to her who these people are, she understood it. Um, you know, it's, it's a fraternity, um, a sorority, if you will, of people who are outside and have no choice to go into this. Um, and that was, I think, one of the reasons that she really felt comfortable. It made me think um, one day I was um, sort of reflecting back on it, Exodus 22, 20. Uh, you shall not wrong a stranger or oppress him for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You know, again, it's our outsider past. Now, Jews are not outsiders to this industry anymore. We, we have museums. Um, certainly, we can be marginalized at times, but, but that's our roots and that those roots have been repeated. Let me go. I have, I have one more slide and it doesn't want me to, let's see. There we go. There she is. I want to I want to end with my Bubby in her basement with her junk. Um, uh, my father used to complain that uh, the biggest thief in his business was his mother. You know, because she would people would bring in metal, and if she saw anything that she thought was good, candlesticks, vases, vases, uh, you know, planters, um, you know, uh, she she considered it her right to take what it was her son's and bring it home. And she did. And she was very, very proud of this junk. She was never shy about showing it. Although if you know, came to her house and she offered to show it to you, it was a great honor. And I always tried to impress that upon um, my friends. Anyway, um, that's what I learned from her. You know, she learned, her, her father learned, the people who I've visited around the world They've all learned to value those things that others don't value. Um, she saw value in here and she was very proud to show it off. Um, and she in turn learned to value those who others don't value. You know, um, she was very touched um, when we started seeing um, uh, Hispanic migrants up to the Twin Cities um, get into the scrap business. And she, um, she could be a tough cookie on the scale, but she was always extra kind to them because she recognized something in them um, that she had experienced. And so um, that to me is, is really um, what I'd like to impart to you this evening as I wrap this is, you know, there's a lot about this industry that's Jewish and in some ways it's becoming less Jewish. It's becoming mainstream, like, like so many of us, it's become assimilated, but who is, is valuing things that others don't value and ultimately that fraternity of scrap um, that I'm so proud to be a part of and have grown up in um, is all about valuing others too. So at that, I'm gonna um, uh, stop sharing the screen uh, or at least try to and open up to questions. I'm, I'm so glad to answer anything. Oh, Adam, that was that was tremendous. I loved it. I loved it. And, and that was one of the things about the book, too, is that you interweave these personal narratives and personal stories with stories about global markets and trade and shipping. And I think it's a really unique way of telling a business story that I especially appreciated. So I'm going to ask the question. I'm sure you get this every time and we're just going to get it out there. Sure. What's going on with China? and scrap. <laughs> um, I, know, 
like 2016 is that the year they kind of embargo uh american scrap and then and then there's this big question mark about well if if china's not taking our plastic our uh mm -hmm. this stuff it's not going anywhere it's being landfilled so what's the deal it's complicated. That's the deal. Um, so the, <laughs> uh, it's complicated. So in 2017, China uh, abruptly announced that they were going to start restricting these imports of recyclables, scrap that they had been taking for years um, and that had become the number one export by volume from the United States to China in most years, even more than soybeans. I mean, it was just an enormous amount of stuff that they used as raw materials to make new stuff. And, you know, there was a lot of consternation in the industry. Why are they doing this? Um, China said they were doing it for environmental reasons. Um, actually, what they really were doing was they were saying, look, we've developed enough and we don't need your junk anymore. We have plenty of our own. And so it was kind of a trade move. Um, they, the China likes to be self-sufficient. We hear that in the news all the time these days about semiconductors and food and everything else. Well, I'll tell you, uh, it happened with scrap as well. So slowly starting in 2018, they closed the door, closed the door, closed the door. It caused them a lot of problems as they did it. Um, at one point they had to reopen the door uh, because they couldn't get enough cardboard to recycle the cardboard they needed to make boxes for various kinds of things. Um, the plastics, um, which is what most people heard about. Um, that didn't mean they stopped plastics recycling. What happened is um, many other plastics recyclers suddenly um, relocated to Southeast Asia. I'll tell you a story. When I moved to Malaysia in 2014, I, you know, I would, I'd see some of my contacts, people in the scrap industry, and I'd say, you know, I'm moving to Malaysia. Uh, you know, if you ever make it down there, give me a call. We'll have dinner. Well, I never heard of it from any of them until like mid 2018 when they all started realizing that Malaysia would be a really good place to relocate a scrap business. So all these Chinese scrap dealers were starting to come down to Malaysia and set up their operations. They would recycle the scrap in Malaysia and then ship it up to China as new plastics. So basically um, we had a few years where everything was a mess. Um, your local recycling program, especially when it comes to plastics, was in real trouble. They didn't have anywhere to send them anymore as the supply chains, of another very popular term these days, uh, reconfigured themselves. But things are better now. Um, and, uh, and actually, Wisconsin is part of the story in a way. Um, one of the things that was very hard to that only China recycled was junk mail. They call it mixed paper. Um, and, uh, and that stuff was all sent to uh, uh, China, into huge, huge paper mills of the size that the world had never seen before. Uh, that stuff is banned. Well, when the ban came down, uh, folks in the United States said, well, maybe there's money to be made um, recycling that junk mail. And so one of the biggest operations, a $500 million operation, uh, opened last year in Green Bay, or maybe it was early this year. So it's one of the United States's, and I think world's largest um, mixed paper recycling operation. So um, the markets have adjusted, it's gotten better. I think that's one of the things that really comes through in the book is the sense of, when we think about the word recycling, we tend to have the sense of this altruistic, you know, yeah. oh, we're doing it for the good. And I think that, you know, understanding the economic factors that actually are at play is so important to understanding what actually gets recycled and what does it. Yeah, it's it's ultimately, I mean, I tell people, I mean, recycling is green, green about dollars. And if you put something in a recycling bin and nobody wants to make something from it, it's trash. It's only recycling is because somebody wants to make something from it. Um, we have a comment that uh, Enid was touched by your common thread of immigrants of all types in the scrap trade and that you are a fantastic presenter. I would agree with that. Oh, um, I want to say, Beth, did you want to ask anything or because you know me, I can keep going all, all yeah, no problem. Um, I loved all the photos, um, were a lot of those from your personal collection or how did you find, you know, the photos in the book and, you know, in your presentation? Because oh, yeah. Yeah, outside of the vintage ones of, of Abe Leader, the Leader family, which are family photos, um, and then I think the uh, couple of photos provided to me by Mr. Nakatsuji, um, I took all of them. So I always, um, whenever I report, um, it's, I, you know, working for trade magazines are great. They'll send you around the world, but they're not going to send you with a photographer. And I'm kind of grateful for that because it made me learn how to take semi-decent photos and then they're mine and I can share them in presentations. Awesome. Because yeah, photo rights are such a, particular business yep. too, yes. <laughs> as I've learned in my time at the library. Right. <laughs>
<laughs> What's the most unusual, like, big pile of thing that you've seen, like, on your travels? Because I can just, like, even what you showed us today was just fascinating to me, the Christmas oh, lights. You know, I'm just trying to think of something wild. You know, for me, um, gosh, off the top, I mean, I've seen, I think I've seen a little bit of everything. I mean, I remember when e-cigarettes were coming out, I was at a junkyard that was in Southern China that was devoted to just recycling um, the, uh, the canisters from e-cigarettes. Um, uh, you know, another time in India, um, India is always a tough place to recycle because, I mean, it's just, the conditions are not good. You know, I didn't talk much about that in this talk. I have another talk about where I talk about the working conditions. Um, but I'll never forget seeing people um, peeling the foil off blister packs. So, you know, if you get like, um, uh, like a, a, a buy Tylenol in a, in a pack and you pull the foil off the back, I saw people actually doing that. Um, on a mass scale, they had gotten the blister packs, which is what those are called from hospitals, and they're peeling the foil off it uh, to recycle it. But, you know, when I think back on, on the things that have astonished me most, it's usually the scale. I mean, I have been, um, I have been in plants where there are tens of thousands of televisions. I've been in um, recycling, uh, textile uh, warehouses where you just you just cannot imagine that there's so much clothing and they're they're bringing in tens of thousands of pounds a day. Uh, it's oftentimes the thing that gets me is the scale. I think as I was watching, you know, the presentation and you see, you know, when you're re reading the book and you're like, oh, Christmas lights can be recycled. Great. That's awesome. They're not going to a landfill. And then on the flip side, you're learning that the way, at least in the early part of the 20th century, that they're being recycled is by burning off the yeah. rubber, and, you know, all the pollutions that it causes it really in that, you know, like you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Um, so I was heartened by the technological approaches that are being found. Do you find that that's similarly happening with e-waste, which also has a lot of environmental degradation that comes with it? I was just talking to somebody about this. Um, so I, I started um, going to e-waste plants um, as early as 2002. Uh, Chinese ones, um, Indian ones, and you know, and they're pretty atrocious. Um, uh, but the the thing that needs to be remembered about the e-waste, it's it's interesting. The the stuff that was being exported from the U.S. to China, imported by China, it wasn't sent there to be burnt. Most of that stuff was actually refurbished. They would part it out. And so many of the people um, who I met in China who were in their 30s, they would talk about how their first computers were used, brought in from the United States. You know, pieces come in from different places. They put them back together. They jerry-rig them. Nonetheless the recycling process when it finally comes is pretty atrocious. The good news is, is that I won't say all of it, but in China, um, especially, which was the largest place where it happened, um, the technology has improved considerably. And you're starting to see options for recycling these things, um, you know, in Europe and in the United States and in Canada and Japan. So I won't tell you that the e-waste problem is over, but the understanding that so many of us have from these early documentaries is definitely outdated, um, except when you get to places that are really inland. Like if you go to, you know, into, you know, really inland in Ghana, where there's just no way to ship it out to somewhere else. Yes, you're gonna see people burning. But I'll tell you what, um, I can tell you uh, with absolute certainty, I can take you to parts of re remote parts of North Dakota where people burn wire still, I know of it. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's very easy to say it's this other that does it, but trust me, um, we do it too. And, and I can tell you, I, I say this without embarrassment. I mean, back before we knew better, I mean, my family, and when I'm talking about, I'm talking back to Abe Leader, he did plenty of burning on his own because didn't really know what the impacts were. I'm not excusing it, but I will explain it. You know, it, it happened everywhere. Barbara comments that this looks like backbreaking work. And I think that's true. Oh yeah. At all scales of, you know, scrap is hard work. It's long yep. hours and the margins are tight. And mm -hmm. we have so many scrappers who kept saying to us, oh, it's feast or famine. Um, and I think that that's one of the things you never know. You've taken in this big uh, shipping container full of potential wire, and maybe it's not what you think it is and all of these right. other sorts right. of things. How, um, so since we didn't hear your talk on working conditions, is there anything that's going on with working conditions? I, I mean, I and, and what are the variables with working conditions 
throughout the yeah. global supply chain. Yeah, I mean, it depends where you are, but I can tell you in China in particular, conditions have gotten a lot, lot, lot better. And the reason is, I'm sure we've all, you know, you've, everyone has heard China has a very rapidly aging population, shrinking workforce, they're being paid more. When you're paying people more and it's hard to get help, you treat them better. Um, and that's just how it is. And so in China, uh, the level of um, occupational safety has risen a lot, um, you know, and, and that's happening in some places, um, not in others. Um, you know, it's, it's all economics really. And, and it's not, you know, it's easy to say, well, you know, the employer treats them bad. Um, there, there are employers who treat people bad, but when you're in emerging market countries, developing countries, you know, places like Ghana, places like Agbag Bloshi, um, you know, they're, you know, you're working for yourself and, um, and, you know, you're calculating for yourself, what is the risk payoff, you know, that that's worthwhile. And unfortunately people make some bad choices, I would say. Um, and it's a hard subject. So it just really depends where you are, but, but in terms of, of China and much of Southeast Asia, it's improved a lot. India, you know, it's hard. I haven't, you know, I, I want, I really want to get back to these places. COVID's made it hard, what's made it impossible to do it, you know, ask me in about a year, because I, I, intend, <laughs> I tend to go back, and I really want to see what happened during the pandemic uh, in some of these places. Do you have a sense, actually, in terms of COVID, how this has shifted markets or changed things? Oh, yeah. I know everything right now is in the supply chain and shipping and trucking, and there's so many hangups in so many different parts of the system. How has this impacted the global scrap market? Oh my gosh, it's been crazy. So let me give you one really entertaining example, um, toilet paper. So most people don't know that there is a lot of, who doesn't like to talk about COVID and toilet paper? Um, so, um, you know, most people don't know. I mean, you can go to your store and you can see, okay, there's, there's toilet paper with recycled content in it and they'll advertise themselves. There's a lot of toilet paper that has recycled content in it that isn't advertised as such. Um, and what they used before COVID was a lot of white off office paper. So, you know, next to the copier, that bin of white copy paper, a lot of that stuff would go to tissue mills and would be mixed into new virgin pulp and it'd be become toilet paper. Well, when offices shut down, that caused a big problem because all of a sudden nobody's generating the white office paper. So all of these mills, these tissue mills had to scramble and, you know, readjust their operations because you can't just put cardboard in and expect it to work. I mean, these are very, very complicated factories. And, and so all of a sudden they had to figure out how to become reliant upon the stuff that people at home were putting in their bins. And so it completely shifted things. And so the home recycling bin during COVID has become much, much, much more important, um, you know, than it used to be. It used to be sort of less preferred form of recycling because it's, it's a little bit dirty. You get food waste on it and everything else. Well, now with the office paper not being generated, um, the, the mills had to rely upon it. So that's just one example. And it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's been flipped and, you know, done backflips all over the place, uh, uh, you know, throughout the pandemic. Wouldn't even have thought about that. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's yeah. fascinating. Yeah, exactly. Have you been able to go to the Green Bay facility? Yeah. No, I, I haven't. I'd like to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it's, you know, it's, it's, we were talking before the, uh, the event tonight, you know, it's, it's the stuff is rising in the Midwest again. And, and, uh, you know, once, once it, everybody feels comfortable moving around a little bit more with factory visits and that kind of thing, I, am, I have a long list of things I need to, to go and see. <laughs> Uh, Sue is asking somewhere in the world, uh, she was taken to a recycling area and she saw children retrieving items, and making lovely animals and clowns and other items to sell. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And she's wondering if you can help narrow down where she might've seen this. She thinks it might've been the Galapagos or South uh, America, but I think also just kind of more broadly, what's the, um, kind of the role in, uh, the, cause it's not just recycling that there is this upcycling that is happening. Mm -hmm and landfills yeah. and all of these spaces and how does that kind of contribute to this kind of broader uh and and is that all very hyper localized or is any of that being filtered out into uh, a more global market um well let me ask the first part of the question which is I, i'm not sure um, where you would have seen that you know my first thought was maybe west africa i've seen some handicrafts pulled out but it could have been brazil um you know, it could have been Delhi in India. I can just, I can just think of a, a lot of different places where it might have been. Um, upcycling and reuse. 
um, do not make a huge impact on the recycling chain yet. It's, it's niche, but the good news is it's growing like crazy. Um, and there is more and more interest in it, especially in developed countries, especially uh, textiles. And I think we're all familiar with a lot of these neat new textile um, reuse platforms like Poshmark and ThreadUp and uh, Depop. And there's more and more interest in reusing uh, clothing. Um, there is a, a right to repair movement in the United States and around the world where people um, are really advocating for um, being able to buy parts and get manuals to things like their phones and computers so that they can fix them on their own and extend their lives and keep them out of the waste stream. And in fact, Apple just yesterday, I just wrote a column about it yesterday, um, announced that they're going to start selling repair parts and tools for the iPhone 12 and iPhone 13 so you can do it at home. Um, and so, you know, that's a major, major shift. Uh, you know, this, I'm not trying to market the book. My second book, in a way, is secondhand, is, is a lot about this and, and what these, what this, what's happening here. That was a fun book to do. Um, you know, I got to experience the global garage sale. So I think there is a change. And ultimately, it's about consumers rethinking how they buy and what they want to buy. Um, and, but it's, it's still very early in the game, as best I can say. We have a question from our chat about what is done with newsprint. Oh yeah, I mean newsprint. Uh, uh, newsprint is easily recycled. There isn't as much of it anymore, so the uh, the mills aren't as reliant upon it. But it used to be a major, major constituent of of the recycling supply chain. Twenty years ago, if you went and looked in a blue bin, it, you'd have a bunch of Sunday papers stacked up in there, and that newsprint could be recycled into new newsprint. Some of it would go to tissue mills, deinking was a process so you could make it into toilet paper. And there's some of that still goes on, but it's a diminishing um, a diminishing supply. People are buying fewer and fewer newspapers, but, but it, it, is, it is a commodity grade and mills will buy it and recycle it. So newsprint print is diminishing. What is a growing recycling market? What is something that we are actually better able to handle at this point and that um, in big amounts? Uh, cardboard is growing like crazy because of e-commerce. Yeah, residential cardboard sense. yeah that's that's, that's huge yeah that's the big one so <laughs> and, and is the price going up or no it's uh... oh my gosh it's gone crazy i mean the, the demand for cardboard is outrageous all recyclables right now um, because of the supply chain uh, people need raw materials to make stuff so it's a really good right now you know as you know from the exhibit it's boom and bust in the recycling industry we are in a really good boom period right now well um, this has been fat. Oh, wait. Uh, we have one more question. Sure. Why are we told to stop separating our recyclables? Wouldn't it be easier for recyclers if we kept things separate? Great question. So there, um, the, your local recycling plant is called a MRF, a municipal recycling um, facility, and they have amazing uh, technology. They, they can use x-rays, lasers, specific gravities, all kinds of things to separate this stuff out. Um, they were built to separate it out. And um, is it 100% is it clean? No, when you hear about people talk about contamination and recycling, it's often because you get food or a little bit of plastic in with the cardboard. So yes, it is better to separate it out. But right now, um, you know, during, during the 90s and 2000s, so much of the recycling um, infrastructure in the United States was built for what's called the single stream, throw it all together and let the technology separate it. But that might be changing, we'll see. So this is really our final question. Okay. Um, one of our uh, docents actually, Bev Ugent, wanted to know if you're acquainted with any of the scrappers in Milwaukee. Uh, Miller? Yeah. Miller was the big, the big uh, yep. kahuna in Milwaukee yeah. for many years. Yep, yep. Uh, I'm familiar with them for sure. Um, and as a kid, uh, uh, actually interacted a few times with some of the members of the family. And, the, and I think that's the thing that we discovered is that that's such a tight knit industry. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, even if yep. you're in Minnesota and there. Yep. And, and I yep. think there was a longtime member of the leader family who taught at our Milwaukee Jewish Day School. And well, I, I know so. Oh, I'm like, I'm pretty sure that that's, <laughs> yeah. a, that there's a, there's an actual Milwaukee connection to Leader yeah. Brothers. Yeah, yeah, there is. Wait, so who is it? And why can't I? Maryland, Maryland. Oh, Maryland Leader. Yeah. There you go, guys. You heard it here first. Um, thank you so much. This has been so enlightening. I really, I, and this is why I say, if you haven't read Junkyard Planet and Secondhand is on my list of things to read, it is a great book. It really does illuminate 
this really complex issue and bring it down to the human level, which I think is just something that you can't, uh, you can't say enough about. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for this chance. It really meant a lot. So I also, as I'm finishing up, Beth, do you guys have any programs you guys want to announce before I, uh, I close no, out? So stuff going on. Um, I guess our big news is that our central library is has more openness now after um you know we've been through some ups and downs with COVID so our children's room at Central Library is open again just check hours before you come down along with some of the other rooms um to keep up with all of the great programs that we have going on at the library I just encourage everyone to sign up either for our Twitter feed our Facebook page or you can always go to mpl.org and keep up with everything that's happening and um, we also have a really awesome youtube channel where a lot of our recorded stuff is hanging out and you can watch that at your leisure so thank you so thank much for having you. me and i'm so glad i was able to meet you tonight adam and thanks to the douche museum for our partnership on this excellent series so thank you so much there are a couple of great things coming up with the at the museum on Tuesday, November 30th, that's the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, we have a tour of the Russian Metro, uh, exploring the unique underground palaces of Moscow and St. Petersburg. If you happen to be part of our Global Museum Passport last year that we went on the tour of uh, the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, uh, our tour guide is the same and she's amazing. So please make a point of marking your calendars noon on November 30th. Um, and then on December 9th, we are picking up with scrap programming again. And this is a really interesting program. We have Arnie Peltz and Joseph Ehrlich talking about the scrap industry um, and its impact and its connection to Holocaust survivors in Wisconsin. We feel like this was a pretty um, unique Wisconsin experience. And we're really excited that Arnie uh, and Joseph will be in conversation together facilitated by Rachel Peltz. And that's going to be on Thursday, December 9th at seven o'clock PM. Programs like this are really made possible through funding and funders. And if you, I know many of you already made a donation, but if you haven't, uh, Cassie's gonna throw a link in the uh, chat. And for me, this is, uh, this is goodbye. So thank you all so much for everything. I have loved every moment at Jewish Museum Milwaukee and I've loved working with all of you. So have a wonderful, wonderful night.